Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, a leading energy expert offers his views on Minnesota's energy future, a plan for clean energy, and a proposal to close achievement gaps by recruiting more teachers of color. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Lawmakers and Governor Walls are creating goals and crafting proposals to direct Minnesota's energy future. Gerard Reed is a founding partner of London-based Alexa Capital and a leading authority in energy investments. He's here this week to offer his perspective to lawmakers, and he joins me now in the studio. Welcome. Nice to be here. I watched your presentation at the Berlin Eco Summit from last May. You draw a parallel between the energy transformation that occurred at the 20, turn of the 20th century to some of the transformation that's happening now as we've moved into the 21st century. Can you describe that quickly? Well, if you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, what we actually had was three revolutions. We had electrification of the world. The second thing we had was the internal combustion engine. And we also had oil. And I believe we're in, the same, in a similar moment today. And if we go back 20th century, in Europe and North America, what we do is we created some of the global giants that still exist today. So this is GE, this is companies like Bosch, Ford, Daimler, that have lasted for 120 years. And I think the wealth of, of the Western world was built on this energy and, and mobility revolution. I think we're going through the same moment now. And what, the, what we're doing now is actually we're moving towards the electrification of transport and the renewableization of electricity. That's, that's the changes that we're going through now. You, in your work, you offer financial advice to clients and organizations in energy, technology, mobility, and infrastructure. What do you see as the biggest challenges facing a state government like Minnesota's? Well, it's the past. And the past, what I mean by the past is, is that we've led transport and energy for 100 years and now what I think is happening is that we have a revolution going on. And in revolutions, people die, companies die, and change takes place. And that's not easy to actually go through as a, as a, as a, as a, as a regulator or a politician. So you're talking about the revolution. And you, you, in your talk, you spoke of China uh, taking the lead now in emerging energy solutions. You mentioned electrification, materials, uh, how they're moving people. But they are an emerging global economy, are, and you kind of said this, you know, here in the United States, in Europe, we are more established. So should we keep up? Can we keep up? Is that, should we be following China's lead? We have no choice. Um, so where I come from in Europe, I mean, our biggest, our biggest industry is, is automobiles. So what if we produce all the automobiles in China? What if all the technology that goes into that is produced in China? Well, that's going to have a very big impact on the, uh, on the economies of you know, Central Europe. So I think this is, uh, this is very important that we catch up. But that's also another thing to look at it is it's an opportunity. We, I mean, our economies need to grow. So if you look at this and you say, actually, transport's going to electrify. We're going to meet, move towards services in and around uh, transport. Yeah, great. Let's go for it and make some money along the way. This is huge change that you're talking about, though. And people tend to be afraid of change. What do you say to those that, that really want things to stay as they are? Things never stay as they are. I mean, that's the reality. If we all get older, then, and you know, the world's going to be a completely different place in 10 years than it is today. And I think the big change that we have right now is artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence, I think, is as big as electricity was 100 years ago. And that's profound. And we have to understand what impact that te technology is going to have, um, we need to prepare for it. Climate change comes into this argument um, on political levels and scientific levels. Um, there's, but in this energy transformation that we're talking about, should we think of it in, climate as terms, in terms of climate change, or should we think about it in terms of economic opportunity, as you say? I, I don't think it in terms of climate change. I, I think of it in terms of economics. Because, and you have to think in terms of economics because we need to make money out of what's going on, right? That's the way our economies work. And I think the byproduct of, say, for example, putting solar panels on your roof and actually renewabilizing and also electrifying is that it's also good for the environment. But I, I think they have to go together. If you just sort of focus on climate change and environment, 
you're just going to have resistance all the time. But if people can make money out of this, then it's much easier. There are geopolitical ramifications for this kind of change because the resources that we have drawn on in the past will not be needed anymore. And so therefore, economies and governments could change as a result, yes? Uh, absolutely. And that's why it's critical to understand the changes that are going on in this world. Because as you said, they will have geopolitical ramifications. What are some examples of the kinds of big change that you see coming down the pike where technology, new energy economy might be, say, in 10 years? Well, I think the big thing you'd see in over the next 10 years is we're probably going to see peak oil demand. And that's, that has a big impact. So if you see peak oil demand, that has an impact in terms of investments in the oil industry and stuff like that. And I think the other thing you're going to see is, well, if peak oil demand, well, what's going to happen? Well, as we electrify the automobile, when you think of what materials go into, the, into, into, into a, say, a battery, well, it's lithium, it's cobalt, it's nickel, and they, they're produced in different countries than where the oil is. And so we're definitely going to see a transfer of wealth from, I'd say, oil-producing countries into countries that produce these materials that go into uh, these electric cars and wind turbines and stuff like that, but also who has the technology. Because that's the critical thing, who has the technology, because that's where the value add is. But you say peak oil demand, meaning that we are still going to continue to increase our consumption of oil as part of this transformation? No, what I mean by peak oil demand okay. is I think within 10 years, we will see not peak oil supply, but peak oil demand, which means is demand for oil globally will peak. Oh, I see. And, and, and what, what I mean by that is, is that you, you, what you're going to do as you electrify the automobile, then what happens is, and by the way, not just electrify the automobile, what you do, you go into car sharing and stuff like that, then what actually ends up happening is that we, we're not buying as much oil as we did before. And that has very big ramifications. And so then that continued transformation. Mr. Reed, what a fascinating topic. Thank you so much for your time mm. today. Thank you. Senator David Senjim has introduced the Clean Energy First Act, a bill intended to stimulate a conversation among lawmakers about the state's energy future. He joins me now to talk more about it. Thanks for being here. It's good to be here. As you said in committee, this bill, the Clean Energy First Act, is, quote, motivational, a 25 to 30 year bill. What is your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? Well, I think I recognize, and I think uh, a good number of people in, in our society now recognize that uh, the future of energy is changing. And to not recognize that, I think, uh, frankly, is, uh, is, would be wrong and be a mistake on uh, behalf of our state, our country, perhaps our world. So it is changing. So then, then how do we make a change? And so the goal of this bill is to move through this change in a, in a methodical way, an intelligent way, understanding where we are and, and how we might get there, but not necessarily putting it on the back of a bumper sticker or something like that. It, it's uh, to use a studied approach to, to clean energy and, and moving clean energy forward, in this case in Minnesota. Are you finding open-mindedness about this topic among your colleagues? I think so. More and more, even, even since the advent of this bill, uh, I think uh, we're able to talk uh, about this with, uh, with good reason and, and, and good discussion uh, amongst colleagues and so on and so forth. I think, I think there's a recognition that, uh, that, yes, times are changing and we need to change with it. At the federal level, the Democrats are talking about their Green New Deal. Uh, at the state level, Governor Walls has uh, issued a plan to have the state using 100% clean energy by 2050. To what degree has this issue been politicized, and how do we find common ground so that we're moving forward in a way that's best for all of Minnesotans and Americans? Well, the aspirational goal for clean energy is fine. I, I can live with that. You can pick your numbers, whatever you want to be. Uh, the, the, the political part of this is the whole discussion of climate change and whether you get into that or not. And I, I choose not to because uh, it's, it's not productive, too much resistance. Uh, you can't go down this path if you're going to be interrupted with the, you know, the whole discussion of climate change and whether that's real or not. So let's just base it on the fact that technology and the economy are going to take us into a, a new energy future and that's going to be built around renewables. As I scanned the bill, uh, there were phrases like local benefits, local workers, local job creation, and community development um, that sort of jumped out, catchphrases. Um, in what ways does implementing alternative energy technology help our economy? 
Well, I'll just go back a, a half a step, and that's to say that over the next maybe 20, 25 years, a good number, in fact, probably most of our power plants in Minnesota are going to be closing. They're just wore out. And uh, so recognizing that, and this bill does, what, how, what are we going to do? How are we going to approach that? And uh, as these plants wear out and new technology emerges, uh, we're going to have a lot of workers left on the side unless we uh, have some form of picking them up, so to speak, and, uh, and letting them continue as, uh, as good parts of our society, tax-paying tax uh, citizens, and so on and so forth. So the bill does call for uh, dealing with that transition, that, that human transition into other careers. So as, as the energy future changes, the ramifications, making sure that local economies right. are, are yes. taken care of. And by the way, it affects a lot of cities. Uh, th these are, in many cases, major power plants in, in, in relatively smaller cities, so to speak. And, and that tax base is just vital for them. So we've, we've got to make that transition, uh, transition for them and, as well as we can. Well, and speaking of transition then, in committee, you referenced off-ramps for utilities to use in planning how they'll move forward. And my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that means that you're allowing the industry or the utilities to make the choices that best suit them, rather than prescribing um, you know, the state saying, this is how you shall do it. Instead, you're letting them sure. make their best argument. Do I understand that right? Not, not quite. Uh, what this bill is all about is the utilities go through a resource planning process. They bring that process to the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, and, and that process is all about as they are going to retire facilities or as they're going to need additional energy, how do they approach it? And this bill says you must consider renewable or clean energy first. There are different forms, hydro, et cetera, et cetera, wind, solar, and so on. But you must consider clean energy first. Uh, then at that point, if in fact, uh, for reasons of affordability, reliability, distribution, a whole number of things, that's not feasible in that particular instance, the Public Utilities Commission can grant them an exception uh, and uh, and moved slightly different direction, but it does emphasize that the future of energy in Minnesota is clean energy. Do utilities need incentives or goals in order to meet this, or is there just an inevitability factor? I think most utilities, XL being a prime example right here in Minnesota, are recognizing that this is the future. I'm not sure that they needed to be incented anymore to do that. Uh, uh, XL, uh, what is 20, uh, 85 percent or so by 2050, uh, that's a giant step and they took it on their own. So I think more and more utilities are going to recognize the future and step out uh, and address that future uh, on their own volition. The Senate uh, Energy Committee recently spoke once again about lifting the moratorium on nuclear power plants. Um, and you just mentioned XL Energy. Their CEO, Ben Fokey, said that losing nuclear, he wants to keep Prairie Island and Monticello open losing it would be taking a step back towards their carbon-free future. Do we really need to, do we need to keep talking about nuclear power? Well, I think so. Uh, and, and by the way, we don't, uh, in this bill, uh, we don't suggest that nuclear power should go away in this bill. There's going to be other bills, I suspect, by other authors that, that do that. And uh, come 2030 and 2033, both of those sites are in Minnesota, Prairie Island, and Monticello are up for re-permitting. And the legislature, whoever they are in those days, uh, will uh, decide whether or not that's going to be granted. So, uh, so I think that's up in the air. But for now, at least with respect to this bill, nuclear power is clean power, just not unlike wind, solar, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we're not going to touch it. Senator Senjum, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. As lawmakers explore new voting technology to aid people with disabilities, Chair of the Senate Government Committee and former Secretary of State Mary Kiffmeyer offered a preview demonstration of the Omniballot tablet, a cost-effective and easy-to-use ballot marking device. Well, the functioning of an Omniballot piece of equipment will function very similar to any other piece of equipment that is designed to assist those with disabilities to mark their ballot. And so it'll have a keypad that will have the customary forward, up, down, reverse, back, hold, stop, pause. It'll also have the customary uh, sup and, sip and puff type of equipment for those who may be paralyzed that they need to use. Uh, it would also have just a whole variety of features that today are normal and customary in any piece of equipment that is marking the ballot on behalf of a voter. 
I think that um, in this particular case, uh, the situation we've had is like the auto mark is aging, it's old, it's heavy, and it's expensive to maintain. So the search we are looking for is to be able to have equipment that is cost effective. These are not necessarily pieces of equipment that get heavy use, but they are required by both federal law, the Help America Vote Act, and Minnesota state law to be in every single polling place available there. And probably the most important consideration is for the disability community. As a matter of fact, the three of them that I chatted with before uh, coming to talk with you uh, were part of the testing and the development of this piece of equipment to make sure. And Minnesota's uh, community that has disabilities is very active and very involved in this kind of equipment. Uh, and that's greatly appreciated, not only here in Minnesota, but also across the country. Minnesota is known as an engaged, involved community, so they're active and involved. And that, that, that helps make sure that when a company does come out with some equipment, that has been field tested by those who actually have to use them. But the main thing is preserve the paper ballot we have today, and we have it today, and not change that. Just because some equipment company says, well, um, I have this, but you're gonna have to change so some people don't have the same ballot. I'm just saying, absolutely not. No way, no how. So I'm standing up for those with disabilities to protect them that and to make sure that they keep that same ballot now and going forward into the future. Earlier in the session, lawmakers and advocates promoted a comprehensive bill that would increase the number of teachers of color and American Indian teachers in Minnesota schools. Breaking down the barriers for people of color and American Indians to become teachers is an important part of fostering a productive, inclusive environment. And I know that from being a new teacher those many years ago, that the mentorship of a wonderful, wonderful woman, a woman of color, uh, her name was Dolores, left me with a unique perspective and skills that stayed with me all of these years and made me a better teacher and collaborator in the classroom and in my life. Life. We know that when our educators reflect the diversity of our students, we will truly be much more successful in narrowing our persistent achievement and opportunity gaps that are among the worst in the country. As somebody that was adopted, I was born in Columbia, and somebody that was adopted, I grew up in kind of a suburban uh, middle class uh, family, and I didn't really connect with my ethnicity uh, like many uh, students of color. They never see a teacher of color, uh, a lot of them, throughout their whole um, educational career. And so I think it's important. And when I got to the legislature, I was able to kind of identify with uh, some issues that I hadn't when I was growing up. And as we look at the um, tight labor markets, we recognize that new Americans um, are also an important factor in our economic prosperity and, and filling our workforce shortage. This bill addresses barriers with both policy and appropriations. And it sets a clear path to attract, prepare, and help candidates complete their programs through marketing grants and scholarships. It focuses on meaningful methods of retention, like mentoring and affinity group support. And it provides districts with the ability to attain and support their educators in becoming um, or remaining teachers, and also higher education uh, programs to support pre-service teachers of color. As is our responsibility, we advise that the state meet its duty to provide all students with equitable access to effective and diverse teachers who reflect the diversity of students in their district per 2016 adopted state law. Now joining me to talk about efforts to recruit more American Indian teachers and teachers of color is the author of the Senate bill, Senator Patricia Torres Ray. Welcome. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. One of the findings of the most recent Minnesota Teacher Supply and Demand Report is that the percentage of teachers of color remains stagnant while the percentage of students of color continues to grow in Minnesota. So briefly, what does this bill do? So this bill really is a comprehensive uh, effort that was developed by a large coalition of educators, experts, activists, uh, students, parents, 
who came together, about 1,200 people, to really talk about what is that we need to do in the short and the long term. So input was gathered uh, around the state of Minnesota. And we concluded that, uh, in reality, what we've done over the last 10 years to recruit uh, teachers of color has been uh, inadequate, very small steps that are underfunded, and that we needed a more comprehensive, aggressive approach. So this is a request for $85 million to really have uh, a greater impact to address several components that need to be addressed under one bill. And so the uh, most important thing is that we have a path to increase teachers of color by 2% every year. And we are providing the incentives and the direction on how to do that. And um, so we are proposing the expansion of existing programs that we currently fund inadequately, like uh, the Grow Your Own Pathways, uh, we have um, intro to teaching programs that are already in place but don't receive enough funding, expand resources for uh, increasing the number of uh, American Indian teachers, um, the urban teaching programs. So we have uh, several programs that have been put in place over the years, but they don't receive sufficient funding to increase the volume and the number of, of students. And so of these, these programs then would be targeted at young students who are maybe potentially just getting started in their careers to kind of direct them into the te teaching field? Exactly. So these programs uh, actually were put in place to do that, to recruit, you know, in high, even in high schools and uh, to promote the teaching profession, to talk about, you know, the specific programs that exist in different universities and you know, educating, educating hmm. students and uh, creating awareness about the need that we have. But due to the underfunding, it's just not pulling in enough students to really address the fact. I think I read 4% uh, of the state's 64,000 teachers are teachers of color, American Indian, while a third of the student population are people of color. So if the idea is then if there's more funding to really get these kids passionate about this field of work, that that could really be a step forward? It's, it's one step, okay. right? Uh, because we, as, as you uh, can imagine, it's very difficult to convince a young person when the economy is doing so well that there are so many options for jobs that pay a lot better than being a teacher. It's a, it's a very difficult profession. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is those programs that are established already, that are doing the work, that have the connection with the different communities, that they will get more funding. The other thing that we are doing is that we are providing grants and we're making sure that we will have a, a, a very large, almost 50% of this funding will be provided for scholarships because that's another incentive that we need to provide. Uh, other careers are doing this, you know, engineering, social work, a lot of professions are providing incentives so that you will get uh, funding that you will get scholarships in order to attend uh, colleges. And Which is really an enticement when you don't have to pay tuition, then you might actually stay and study and work hard. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, I'd like to turn to the concept of mentoring because it was mentioned by more than one person in the press conference. Uh, there's funding in here to, to get school districts to really focus on mentoring, which teachers are very busy, but several people spoke of how important that is. Why is mentoring so important? It's so important because we're making a little difference in terms of recruiting and bringing people to the profession. And then they obtain their license, they come to the classroom, and they leave. So that is one of the most challenging problems that we're facing right now. A report uh, came out from Minneapolis that actually uh, tracked those numbers in terms of the people who are entering the profession and the very few that actually stay. And so we lose most of the teachers that come to teach in the first three years. So what we find from, particularly from teachers of color, is that they are recruited because they bring these different perspectives. They bring, they bring this background, this, they bring connections with the communities to a system that is so disconnected, that really don't know how to tap into this great opportunity that these teachers bring. And so they get very frustrated, they feel like they don't fit into the system, that they are not appreciated, and so they leave very quickly. So what we're trying to do is figure out how do we find these teachers that have stayed in the system, that have gone through this learning process and have adapted, you know, kind of their their curriculums, have adapted some of the, you know, community relations that they have to the community connections within the schools, to work with students. How how 
how have they done this and be successful and stayed in the in you know in the teaching profession for a long time these veterans mm -hmm. that know how to do that so and we then want have to them do that teach these new teachers those skills that they need to to stick it out until they get that body of knowledge that they need to keep going exactly exactly and this is a problem for you know all teachers really in general these young teachers that come in because Minnesota doesn't have an induction um, uh, uh, system so teachers just come to the classroom and we They're say kind of bless you. To the wolves. <laughs> yes, it's true. You know, as I read the bill, there are certain words that popped out um, in terms of work environment and also the environment for students and families. Words like inclusive and respectful and diverse. Uh, at a recent committee, there was a uh, discussion of teacher licensure changes in a five-star rating system. And you spoke up and you said the underlying elephant in the room is that communities of color don't trust the state education system. Do you believe that there are components of this bill that will help those communities better engage with their educational system? Absolutely. You know, we, we hear quite often from young students of color who say, we, we have never been in a classroom with a teacher that reflects who we are, you know, who, who shares with us our, our experiences in the community growing up, racially, ethnically, that don't speak our language. That connection for a young person is incredibly important, especially today when we have very diverse, you know, classrooms. We have uh, students who come from, you know, different parts of the world, where they need to find that they can connect with these teachers, that they can really speak about their experiences, not just academically, because we know that if you feel well, that if you feel welcome, that if you feel appreciated, you're likely to have a conversation with a teacher about issues that are impacting your ability to learn and advance academically. It is very important, and we know that from research. Uh, kids need to find a person that they can relate to in a position of authority. And also, this is not just for children of color. It's also for white children. You know, there was a, a report that came out um, recently that actually um, our lieutenant governor talks about that people um, actually thought that native people were extinct. extinct that we don't have people of color, that we don't have native people in the country anymore. It's just like, what? You know, imagine a child not understanding really our heritage, and in, in Minnesota in particular, you know, 11 tribal strong reservations that really are part of the fabric of our community. Our white children need to know that history and appreciate that history, and they know it by, you know, relating to people, knowing people in these communities. So it is incredibly important that also white children are connected to the experiences of people of color and their classmates because they see their classmate, classmates but they don't see a person that uh, in, in positions of authority from those communities and I think that's a significant problem in Minnesota. Senator Torres, wait, we have to stop there but I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.